Hey, good morning. Uh, you may be seated. If you're a kid, you're dismissed. You can make your way out the sides and out the back. Um, hey, just uh, good to be with you all this morning. I, I, I'm thankful you're all here. I'm especially thankful the lights are on. Man, that, that was something in uh, first service with no microphone, no lights, no slides. Um, my voice is a little shot now, so uh, if I sound raspy, I haven't been smoking cigarettes before church, I promise. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, a couple, a couple things to just keep in mind uh, is we're having baptisms coming up soon, and, and I just want to invite you. If you haven't been baptized, what it is is it's your way of professing to the world, uh, "Hey, I, I've been saved by Jesus Christ. I've given my life to Him," uh, and God calls us to that. It's not something that saves us or gives us salvation, but it's a response of salvation. And so, I want to encourage you. If that's on your heart, come talk to me afterwards. Come talk to Pastor Allen afterwards. We'd love uh, to just talk to you about what it's about, and if you're thinking about it. Uh, second thing is, uh, Alan already mentioned we're having our second men's breakfast this Saturday morning. I'm excited about that. I hope if you're a guy that you can come. Um, God, uh, what I want to say is, is we need godly men, right? Well, we need men that stand up for truth, for righteousness, that lead their families, that, that, that walk in integrity. And we're going to be talking about some of those things this Saturday morning. So I hope you can make it out if you're a man, 9 a.m., uh, right over the building right next to us. Um, but with that, let me pray one more time and we'll look at God's word together. Um, Heavenly Father, you are majestic, you are marvelous, and you are good. And I praise you for all that you give to us, all that you do for us that we don't even see. I think back this last week thinking about all the veterans in our country um, and just what a blessing it is to be able to worship freely here. Lord, we're not afraid of persecution. We're not afraid of the government shutting us down, Lord. And that's because so many men and women have paid the ultimate price. And so I thank you for them and their sacrifice. Lord, I, I thank you um, just for the safety of our country. I'm thinking of all that's going on in Israel, Hamas, and all the bombings and the war on both sides. Lord, what a tragedy and what, what a statement and, and, and a clear picture of the sin in our world, the corruption. And we pray for all of the people affected by that. Uh, Lord, that you'd bring about revival, uh, that many people would come to know you, Jesus, to see there's hope amidst chaos. Uh, that there is a God who loves us even when we're in pain. Lord, I pray that you'd speak through the message today. It's, it's one of those passages that is difficult to understand. Um, and I just pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, whatever we're going through, would you uh, be here with us? In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, um, I'm sure you know all that's been going on in Israel uh, over the last couple, I guess it's almost a couple months now at this point. Um, but the prime minister, a little over a week ago, when people were asking him to stop the bombings, and they're saying, hey, please stop bombing the Hamas and all that, you, you got to just stop doing this, uh, he's recorded saying this. Um, he said, no, you must remember what Amalek has done to you, says your holy Bible. And, th and then he quotes 1 Samuel 15, 3, which is in all of our Bibles. He quotes this verse. Um, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both men and women, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. How do you feel about that? Not, not getting into what's going on with Israel and Hamas and all of that, um, but how do you feel about quoting that scripture? I mean, how do you feel about just that scripture in general, that that's in your Bible? Um, when I heard this, I had a little bit of panic because that's the scripture that we land on this morning as we've been going through the book of Samuel. Um, and I'll be honest, as I looked at this all week long, part of me was like, okay, hey God, can we just skip this? Can, can, can we just kind of overlook this verse? Because this is hard. This is hard to talk about. It's hard to read, hard to understand. How, how do we deal with this? Especially for me, like I have a new baby. You know, thinking about that God would command something like that, that child and infant be destroyed. But, but I do think, you know, one of the things we believe in our church is we believe in exegetical preaching, and that means that we go through the full Word of God. Um, and I think one of the good things about that is that it forces us to look at every text, even the hard text, when it talks about God. Um, but on this note, the, the, the reason why so many of us struggle with this verse is because it's talking about the wrath of God, isn't it? It, it? It's God bringing judgment and wrath on a people group. And, and for most of us, any type of wrath when it's regards to God, um, we struggle with that, don't we? 
Because we like the idea of a gracious, loving, happy God. I mean, nobody argues with that. Nobody's like, man, I just can't believe God's so happy and gracious and forgiving. That's not right. That's not just. Nobody argues that. Instead, what we argue is, well, wait a second. What about these texts when God does show wrath, when God does show punishment, or when he talks about things like hell? How do we deal with that? Isn't that hard? I mean, I struggle with that. I struggled all week reading this in all, in all honesty. But I, I think that the real issue um, it is it's just tough. And what we've done as a society is we've tried to kind of, in order to avoid this, we try to come up with our own type of interpretations about what God is like. Have you ever heard this phrase, um, my Jesus is like this? Heard somebody say that? And so what we've done is we've kind of taken the happy things or the things we like about God and Jesus and we'll focus on that and then kind of hide the negative stuff. And we even kind of put titles or characters with Jesus. Uh, someone was saying that my Jesus is like Buddy the Elf. Um, he says things like, I just like to smile. Smiling's my favorite. Uh, another person said, my Jesus is like Mr. Rogers. Anyone of you remember Mr. Rogers back in the day? And my Jesus says this, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I like you just the way you are. Um, if I had to choose a Jesus to be like, uh, I would pick Bob Ross. How many of you are Bob Ross fans? Um, and my Jesus would say, um, we don't make mistakes. We just have happy little what? accidents, right? And it all turns out to be a beautiful painting in the end. So let's just be happy and be like that. And, and so we put Jesus or God in these categories that we decide. But, but the problem with that is that if God's a real being, if he's a, a real person, do we get to dictate how and who he is? No. No. Right? I mean, just as much, if, if any of you here have ever experienced romance before, you remember when you first met that person, how in your head you imagined what they'd be like and you kind of projected that on them? Of like, you know, maybe you thought, man, he, he, he's just going to come home, he's going to listen to my feelings all night long, never get tired of it, uh, but you finally get with the guy and then you realize he comes home, he's a little irritable, he wants to eat, and then just play video games all night. And, and you're like, wait, what happened here? What about my feelings? I mean, no matter how much you projected on what he's going to be like, he is who he is. Is, and it's the same with God. And, and so, but that's still hard to accept. I mean, we've come up with phrases that make God seem nicer. You ever heard this one? God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. And that seems like a nice phrase because what it does is it makes God seem not so angry. It makes him feel like, okay, no, he loves all people. He just doesn't like bad things. But then you've got Psalm 5, verse 4 that says this. It says, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. You're like, okay, I get that. He doesn't like the sin. But then it says this, evil may not dwell with you. And you're like, okay, yeah, he doesn't like sin. Then it says this, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. What's that saying about God? It's that saying that he despises not just the sin, but sinners. God doesn't send sin to hell. He sends people to hell. How do we justify this? How do we understand this? And I think as a society, what a lot of us has done is we've kind of taken God and, and neutered him and made him safe and made him fit into our cultural ideals of what God should be. And we avoid certain texts, but that's dangerous because if we get it wrong, if we don't understand who God is, um, one day we're going to meet him. And if you get it wrong, it matters. And so we're going to look at a group of people who got this wrong. Their understanding of God was wrong. Their viewpoint of God was wrong. We're going to look at a man who his viewpoint of God was wrong as well. So you still with me? You're probably thinking, why did I come to church today of all Sundays? I promise you there's hope in the end. There's goodness at the end. But we've got to get through some hard verses. So uh, 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 1, says this. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but both kill man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. It's a tough text. How could God say that? How is that okay? How's that in the Bible? Well, we're going to get to that. But before we do, I want to talk about these people, the Amalekites. So when Israel, if you go way back with me, go all the way back to Egypt, they're in captivity, Moses comes, the plagues happen, they get out of Egypt, right? They cross the Red Sea, they're wandering in the wilderness. You remember this? They're wandering in the wilderness, uh, they are vulnerable, 
They don't have an army. They don't have weapons. They don't have city gates or city walls. They don't have a strategic plan. Uh, they're just they're kind of homeless, right? Um, and the Amalekites see this group of people and they take advantage of that. They're like, okay, they're vulnerable. They're homeless. They don't got weapons. Let's go and raid them. Let's kill them, and we'll take possession of whatever they have. Leave them dead, and we're going to take advantage of the situation. So they go try and do that, but God works through Israel and they defeat the Amalekites. And then God says this in Exodus 17, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So God sees the Amalekites be unjust and evil and cruel, and he says, hey, there will be punishment for this. It happens then in Numbers chapter 14, they attack Israel again. God says the same thing. And then in Deuteronomy 25, they attack again in verse 17. It says this, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your ta- and cut off from your tail, those who were lagging behind you. And he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you and the land that the Lord your God has given you from an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven and you shall not forget. The Amalekites were evil people, right? They, they, they preyed on the weak and the innocent. Um, God saw that and said that's not okay because God cares about justice. If you remember the story of Esther, um, Esther, uh, the people of Israel were about to be obliterated, totally wiped out because this guy named Haman was plotting to kill the Israelites. Guess where Haman came from? He was an Amalekite. They were evil people, um, but yet we still have this verse. Yeah, they're evil. And I could say I get justice. I could get if it was just the army, but children? But let's talk about this a little more. Um, In 2015, there was a shooter that walked into a church in Charleston. Remember this? It was a white man walked into a black church and started shooting people up. It was horrendous. It was horrific. Um, imagine this. It, it, we caught that man. What if the judge, when that man stood trial, and, and everybody knew it, it was caught, everybody knew, the evidence was there, it was very clear, it was this man. What if the judge says, hey, all the evidence is out, but you know what? I've been watching some Bob Ross paintings And I feel like that this is just a happy little accident. And I feel like we should err on the side of grace and mercy. So you know what? Don't let it happen again. We're going to let you go on a pass this time. What do you think America would have done? I mean, talk about riots. Talk about rage and anger. I'd be angry. We should be angry because that is not just. You see, the concept there, there is somebody uh, that we wanted wrath and justice to occur on. Because we, in our hearts, cried, this is wrong, this is unjust. That's such an important concept because I think in America, when it comes to God, we only want the grace, love, and mercy, but we don't want the part where God says, hey, because I'm good, I'm a judge. I'm just. Look at Psalm 7, 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. That means God feels anger every day. And you're like, wait, what is that? He's a good God. I thought you're supposed to be happy. You feel angry every day? What are you talking about? Why does God feel anger every day? Because he's a righteous judge, because there's sin in the world. Look at Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God takes sin very seriously. Because before the fall, before there was sin, life was paradise. There was no corruption. There was no pain. There was no abuse. There was no loneliness out of abandonment. None of that stuff happened because there wasn't sin. When sin came to the world, James says it brought forth death. And so out of that, God, who's omnipresent, who sees everything. I mean, just think about that for a moment. He sees everything. So this morning, every child that was abused, he saw and heard their cries. Every older or elderly person that was taken advantage of, he sees that. Every crime, every act of injustice, every murder is in his face at all times because he sees all things. And it says out of that, the goodness of him, the justice in him cries out in wrath saying, this is wrong. Right? In the same way that if you were in a restaurant and you see a man start to beat on a woman, part of you should cry out, I'm going to deck that guy. 
right? Because something says this is wrong. God's heart loves what is good and cries out. Look at Nahum 1, 2. It says this, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and keeps wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. The mountains quake before Him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before Him. The world and all who dwell in it, who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the heat of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by Him. It's not exactly a great wedding ceremony passage. But that verse is saying that God is just, and He hates evil. And the punishment for sin is ultimately death. Right? For the wages of sin is what? Let me tell you a story. Um, there was a professor, and we talked about this, I think, a year ago here. But there's a man named R.C. Sproul. He's a theologian. He passed away. Um, but before, he was a professor at a seminary. And in his class, he had all these students. And he said, hey, how this class works is there are three main papers. There are the three main assignments. They're each worth about 33% of your grade. Um, you have got to turn these in. That's how I'm going to grade you. And he says, here's the thing. You cannot turn in a paper late. If it's late, I will not accept it. You will fail that paper and most likely fail the class. Um, and, and so the students, they heard it. He was abundantly clear. First paper paper comes along. Uh, What happens? Most of the students turn it in on time, and there's a few who don't. And so they come to him, and they're like, okay, please, professor, like, will you just give us grace this one time? Will you just uh, overlook it? Let us turn it in. I mean, this is a seminary for crying out loud. We talk about Jesus and grace. Will you just let it happen? And so Sproul says, he's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you grace this time, uh, but if it happens again, he told the whole class, I'm going to give grace the first one, but for the second and third test, or third paper, if you don't turn it in, I will fail you. So first paper goes, gives grace, then second paper comes, guess what happens? even more students turn it in late. And so he says, all right, you've all failed. And they say, no, give grace. Come on. This is, you know, how many times did Jesus say to forgive? Seven times? Seven. You know, like, please, just give us grace. And so he says, okay, you know what? I'm going to forgive the second paper. But the third one, hear me now. This is it. You will fail. Third paper comes along. Guess what? Even more students turn it in late. He says, you've all failed, and they say, no, you're wrong. How could you fail us? This isn't right. This isn't just. You need to give us what's right and give us grace. And he said, wait, you want me to be just and give you what's right? Then the other two papers that I let you slide, I'm going to fail you for those two. And you see, the point of that story is we can get so used to experiencing the grace of God that we come to expect it, that we get upset when he's actually just. See how that works? The the Bible says that every one of us deserves death because we're all sinful. So that means that every breath you take is because God in His grace is allowing you to live. That He's allowing you to experience joy. That He's allowing you life. And we are so used to that that we learn to expect it that when we see moments where God says no and He actually executes judgment and wrath, they're like, wait a second, something's wrong. But really, every single one of us deserved death. And the Amalekites over and over attacked Israel. And God was victorious through Israel fighting them. And they knew, wait, there's something about this God. Maybe we should repent. Maybe we shouldn't keep doing this. But in their head, they had a low view of God of, no, he's not that powerful. He can't help. Whatever. Maybe he'll be gracious like he's doing. We'll be fine. Until finally God said, no. See how that works? See how that works in our own lives. But the hard thing is, but it still says babies. That's a hard passage. I'm going to be honest. And I studied all week long. I don't have a perfect answer for this. And I don't think anybody does. I do know from one side that nobody deserves life. That God is perfectly just. Uh, that we all deserve death. We all do. And so in one way we can say, okay, we can't argue with God's justice because really no one's innocent. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's still hard. And and I think what comforted me this week is I believe, if you read Scripture through many texts, I won't share them all today, but I believe that babies go to heaven. And I have reason for that. I mean, I I believe, look at how Jesus handled children. He had this abundant love for them. He talked about not causing them to stumble. So I believe babies go to heaven. And if you really read this book, the ultimate good in life is not just life itself, is it? What's the ultimate good? To be with the Father in heaven and paradise. 
And, and so that makes that death is hard, it's horrible, but it's a passing into something greater. And so if God uh, saw this nation that's wicked and punished them, but in His grace said, I'm going to save these babies and bring them up to Myself, that helps me understand this. It's still hard. And I think it should never feel good when you see God execute wrath because He shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have sinned in the first place. It's a part of a fallen world. So this is hard. And I know that's not a perfect answer and we can talk more later. But, but the big idea here is that God is a God of judgment and justice. And we can't take for that for granted. We can't keep pushing it off like the Amalekites. So that's the first part. But the story continues. If you're still with me, uh, let's look at verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fattened calves and the lambs, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. Real quick question. Um, why did God say kill all the animals? That doesn't make a lot. Like, what do the animals do? They're innocent. Animals aren't sinful. They're not made in the image of God. So what's the big deal? The, the point why God said kill all the animals and everything is because God was trying to show his people, hey, this isn't just a raid. You're not just, you know, pillaging these people to take all their stuff like all the other nations. That's what the Amalekites did. They saw their strength in numbers. They attacked weaker people to take and steal what they had and leave them dead. God says, that's not what this is. This is me executing judgment and justice upon a nation. I am God. I am the judge. And I'm using you to execute that judgment. Does that make sense? And so he said, this isn't for you to gain property, to gain animals. See how that works? And so here's Saul... The command is clear. Notice, Saul didn't have a problem killing the people. It says he did that just fine. But what he did have a problem with was killing the animals. And it's not that he was a part of PETA and animal rights activists. The point is, back in the day, what was your main form of currency? Livestock. Animals. So Saul here, he's like, yeah, whatever, I'll kill people. I don't really care. But he's like, but you want me to burn money? Do you, this is good money right here. This is good stuff. Um, I can't do that. And then you're like, well, wait, why, why'd you spare the king, Saul? Like, of all people, shouldn't you kill them? See, back in the day, if you were a king and you defeated another nation, one of the things you did is you'd keep the king alive, and he would be your living trophy and testimony to everybody else that he was defeated by you. And so Saul says, yeah, we'll keep him to show everybody else what I've got going on. Look at God's response in verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I've made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Verse 12, and Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed um, be the way you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, You have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Last verse we're going to read. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. Pause there. Samuel comes. And here's Saul. He didn't fully do what God called him to do. He then set up a monument to praise himself for the victory in battle that God did. Um, and then Samuel says, hey, you fully obeyed God? And he's like, yeah. He's like, well, then what are these sheep and cows everywhere? And he's like, oh, you know what? We, we did that for God. We did that for God. Samuel's not impressed. Verse 20. Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Am Am Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction, but the people took the spoil, sheep, and ox, and the best of things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. After that, God says, you know what, Saul? I reject you as king. What was the big issue? Let me ask you this. Um, you ever had a professor or a teacher or a, or, or a boss that uh, was really harsh, like, like the ones that they force you to do a good job, like that they kind of put the little bit of the fear of God in you before. You, you ever have that where you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm just trembling uh, just seeing this professor. If I see him at Starbucks, I'll go to another Starbucks. Like I, I you know that type of person uh, that, that they put the standards so high that you have to give 110% just to pass the class or just to make this boss happy. So you've had that. Um, but have you ever had, on the other hand, the professor or boss 
that's really kind of timid or lenient before, and you learn pretty quickly of, I can go in late, or, or I can even skip classes, or I don't need to, I can just kind of halfway do all my papers or halfway put in the effort, and it's fine because they're kind of so afraid of conflict or whatever that they'll probably just say, it's okay. You ever felt that before? And so we can do that with God, and that's exactly what Saul did, is he looked at God not as someone to be feared, to be honored, but someone of like, you know what, he'll be fine. I don't need to give him my full effort. He's good. It's just God. He had a low view of God. You ever done anything halfway before? I've struggled with this all my life. My dad had a phrase for me that I won't repeat in church about me doing stuff halfway when I was a kid. Um, but, but I just did stuff halfway, right? Like that's how I, and I still struggle with the day. Like my wife continues, she's like, wait, how did you get through school? How are you at a church? Like what, you know, because it'll be like, take out the trash. I take out the trash. I don't put the bag back in the trash can. You know what I'm talking about? Like everything I do, it's hard for me to bring it to completion. And, and growing up, it wasn't that big of a deal other than frustrating my dad all the time. Uh, but what was the big deal is when I started to work on on cars. Um, I'll never forget my first time I changed the brakes. Now, if you know brakes, I'm not going to get too nerdy, but you have this thing called a rotor and brake pads, right? Sometimes you got to change the rotor. And in order on my car to change the rotor, you had to spin this nut off, take the bearings out, and replace the rotor. Uh, not that hard to do. I did it. I was 16. I felt pretty good about it. But there was this thing, there's this nut on the end that basically holds the whole wheel and tire on. Um, but that nut has this thing called a cotter pin. And what it does is it slides through the nut to hold it and make sure it never comes off. And the thing with cotter pins is they can get rusty, they can get old, and they get really difficult to find and pull out of the nut. And so I remember I spent like an hour trying to get this thing out when I was 16. I was so frustrated. I finally got it out, put the new brakes on, put the nut on. But instead of putting the cotter pin back in, I had a thought. I was like, what if I just don't put it in? Because then next time when I change the brakes, I won't have to deal with it. And I thought I was a genius. So I put everything back together uh, except the cotter pin, and I begin to drive. And I'm thinking, I'm a success, right? I'm 16. I did my own breaks. Women will want to date me now. I'm feeling good about myself. And I'm just cruising. You know, I'm just going through. I have my music blaring. And I'm driving through Covina. And I remember I hit a speed bump, and I had a truck so I could hit speed bumps fast and hard. So I kind of speed up to hit the speed bump to be rebellious, you know? And so I go over the speed bump, and it, it goes pretty good, except out of the corner my eye, I see a tire rolling <laughs> on the side. And I'm like, man, whose tire? How is it rolling? And then it triggers my head of, that's mine. <laughs> and I don't know how, it, it just felt like it lasted like five minutes where I'm cruising until eventually cars don't work very well as a tricycle, if you didn't know that. Hits the ground, spins out of control, and I hit a pole. Um, I learned my lesson, don't do stuff halfway. But, but I mean, I, I still struggle. Yesterday I was welding a new muffler on my car and you're supposed to do a 360 degree weld on the pipe to hold it in. I just did half because I had other stuff to do and the muffler fell off when I went for a drive. Um, the point is, doing stuff halfway doesn't work, does it? Doesn't impress anyone. And, and the reality is, like if you see a sports star that's putting in half effort on the field, it's gross. Right? I mean, if you have an employer and you come in for half your shift consistently, um, what's going to eventually happen? You're going to be fired. Um, if you go to school and you go half the semester and then skip after midterms and never come back, what's going to happen? You're going to fail that test. The reality is the people that we value over us, when we find someone as important or dignified or someone worthy of respect, we put in full effort. When we don't respect them, when we don't think highly of them, what do we do? We put in less effort. Saul here looked at God and said, you know what? He'll be fine. He'll be gracious. I don't need to fully listen to him. It's not a big deal. God will understand. And God looks at him and says, Saul, I don't want half your heart. I want your whole heart. And that's the same with us today, isn't it? God doesn't want half your heart. There's a guy by the name of John Mayer, if you've heard him before, right? He wrote this song that says this, I can't stop loving you with half of my heart. Half of my heart is the part of a man who's never truly loved anything. Down the road, later on, you will hate that I never gave you more than half of my heart, but I can't stop loving you. How many of you with love are okay with someone loving you with half their heart and being half devoted to you? Some of you are like, well, if it's John Mayer, I'd probably be okay with that. But I'm saying, the, the point is, 
is you can't handle that, right? Like, like we need your full heart. I need your full commitment. And God says the same in Deuteronomy 6.5. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, and with all your might. Psalm 119.10, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. God even told Samuel, or Saul through Samuel in verse 22 of Samuel 15, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. God says, I won't be patronized, Saul. I want everything. I'm not someone that you can just hold so with such a low opinion that you can just kind of scoot through life and not care. And I think we can do that so easily, can't we? I hear this all the time. Hey, if you stand before God, is He going to let you in? Is He going to be okay? And you know what they say? Well, I'm a good person. I'm better than other people. I'm not a murderer. Sure, I haven't dedicated my life to the Lord. Sure, I didn't obey. I put my faith in trust. I didn't do that. But, you know, I'm not like these other people. So God, you should be good with me. You should be okay. Is the standard that low with God that if you're not a murderer, you're therefore a good person? Or or, or maybe it's like, you know what, God, you should be fine with me. I I haven't really obeyed you with my whole heart. I haven't fought sin, but I gave to church a few times. So therefore, you should be happy with me. Or or maybe it's like, God, the, the call to love my spouse or to be kind to my parents or to be kind to the people around me in my home is really difficult. But it's so much easier to be nice to the people at church or work or the neighborhood that I only have to see for a couple minutes at a time. So I'm nice to all of them. They think really highly of me, but I'm a jerk at home. But God, you'll be happy with that, right? If I just do a little effort. We think that God is just up there like a desperate person who's just happy for any bit of performance. But God says the standard to please me is holiness, is perfection, because I'm a holy God. Saul didn't understand it. God says, Saul, I'm going to remove you from the kingdom. I'm going to remove you from being king. Saul cries out, please forgive me. And then in verse 28, God says, no. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn away the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And you ask, it's like, well, wait a second. Isn't God supposed to be forgiving? Like, isn't that the, that the whole message of the gospel? That if we ask for forgiveness, God forgives us. We're saved, right? That's true. But see, there's a difference Here, because Saul is not asking to be forgiven for salvation. Saul is asking to keep his kingdom. And in our own lives, if you are in Jesus Christ, guess what? Here's the good news. You never have to experience the wrath of God if you put your faith in Jesus. That's the greatest news in the world. And you can, today, I'll give you an opportunity to put your faith in Christ. You can be saved. You don't have to be afraid. But even if you're a Christian, you can still make decisions that maybe God doesn't damn you to hell, but your decisions will affect your life here and the consequences will be present. I said this a few weeks ago, but I know I'm a pastor, right? And I'm thankful for that. I'm honored to do that. And I feel like God has blessed me with that. And I went to seminary, all that stuff. But I know that if I go have an affair this week, it's over. If I go start taking money out of the plate, it's over. And now the plan that God has had has, will radically change because of my disobedience. Does that mean I'm going to hell? No, God can forgive me. But it means that the plan and the trajectory that God has will be radically altered by my decisions. All of us. Our sins have consequences. Galatians 6, 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Ecclesiastes 12, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. We're all held accountable. This morning in your life, do you have such a low view of God that you're like, he'll be fine. Doesn't matter. I don't need to give him my whole heart. I don't need to be all in. I'll just keep doing my thing. Maybe I'll show up to church every once in a while. Maybe I'll put a little bit of money in the plate. Maybe I'll do good work here, good work there. Because God's my viewpoint of Jesus. is He's just gracious and loving and good. And he'll just accept me as I am. And have you forgotten like the Amalekites and like Saul, that God is holy and righteous. And he calls us to holiness doesn't mean he's evil. It means he's just and he hates sin. And it's his love for you is why he calls you out of sin. Because sin corrupts you. It changes you. It destroys you. And it destroys everyone around you. And that's why God says, hey, I hate this. Now let me change you and save you. With all that said, this is a heavy text. And I think you can leave here feeling kind of negative, right? Like, okay, God's a judge. Great. Let's pat each other on the back and feel bad about ourselves. Like, what do we do with this? 
I think it's a moment to pause in our own lives and ask, what's my view of God? Have I bought into society's thing where they've taken Christianity and God and they haven't held to this and they say, God is just this neutered puppy that is so desperate for affection that he'll take you uh, when, however you are and it doesn't matter. There's no standard of holiness. Or, or like some of our new modern worship songs that he's just this spineless teenage boy that's so desperate for affection that he'll take anybody. That's not God. He's righteous and he calls us to repentance and to believe in him. Here's the good news, though. Verse 28, we skipped over it, but look at this. Verse 28, he says, Saul, I'm taking the kingdom. And he says, I've given it to a neighbor. What's he talking about? God's saying, Saul, I've taken the kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to this guy named David. Why is that significant? Because David, we're going to see, has a son. And then David has another son, and another son, and another son. And it goes down the line until finally, in the line of David, a man is born named who? Jesus Christ. And Jesus goes to the cross. What's the punishment for sin for everybody? What do we all deserve? What's the justice of God? Death. What does Jesus do on the cross? He dies on the cross in our stead so we can be saved and we can be free from the wrath and judgment of God. And what that means is that passages like 1 Samuel 15 that are dark, that are bleak, that show the wrath of God, even in that, God is working to bring about mercy and hope for mankind. That's the beauty of the Bible. That God is not just a God of wrath, but He's a God of love. And that even that, that, that phrase that, oh, God loves sinners but hates the sin. No, God despises all people, everyone who sins, but He also loves them at the same time and sent Jesus so we can believe in Him and be saved and free from the bondage of sin. And that's why we're here today. And in your own life, even if you've had a low view of God, even if you've messed up like the Amalekites and messed up like Saul and totally, utterly failed and totally struggle all the time, guess what? If you believe in Christ, you can be saved. And His heart is that you'd be saved. Look at this in Ezekiel 18. Megan said it. I'll start it in verse 31. It says this, God says to His people, cast away all your transgressions that you've committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. That's the message of God. He's a God of justice, but He doesn't want to give wrath to anybody. He wants everybody to be saved. Look at 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's made a way that we don't have to fear His wrath. This morning, don't take your half-hearted devotion and your half-hearted works like Saul did and make excuses and say, oh, I'm good. I've done, I've done these good things over here, so we good here? No, come to Him in repentance and say, God, I bring nothing but sin. Save me. I believe in the cross. I have no excuse. I'm broken. I know You're a God of wrath. I deserve death. But I look to You that you died for me and I trust you. This morning, if you put your faith in Jesus, this morning, you never have to experience God's wrath if you put your faith and trust in Him. And if you're here and you've already done that, if you've already believed in Him, remember who He is. Remember, He wants your whole heart. He don't want you half in, half out. He wants you to give everything to Him. Lay it down, whatever sin you're struggling with, whatever fear you're going through, whatever it is, are you all in? And say, God, I don't want to give you half of my heart. I want to give you everything. I believe maybe God's speaking to your heart right now of what that area might be that he's saying, hey, it's time to give this to me. It's time to repent. It's time to do the right thing. Let go of the wrong thing. There's hope in him. Let me pray. Father, we are so thankful that you are not just a God of wrath, but a God of grace and mercy. I thank You, Lord, that even though there's sin in this world and You have to punish that, that there's forgiveness because of what You did at Calvary. And I pray if any of my friends in the room right now don't know You, Jesus, that today they would say, I don't want to be like Saul or the Amalekites and ignore and ignore and push and push and just think I'll, be, I'll skate by, but instead would they say, no more. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I believe that you died and you rose again. Here's my life. I trust you. Save me. Change me. And I pray for the rest of us as well that already know you. 
that this morning we'd say, Lord, here's my whole heart. Here's everything that I am. All that I am. Lord, I repent of the areas where I've been holding to myself. And I give them to you. Jesus, I thank you that there's hope after death. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the resurrection. And I thank you that if we, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In your name we pray. Amen.